Hello, hello everybody. Thanks again for joining me for another video. I really appreciate you tuning in. This is Charmaine and this channel is a place where we can discuss everything under the umbrella of, of MPD. Uh, thank you so much for my subscribers. I really appreciate you supporting the content and supporting the channel. I'm trying to build a community here of education and healing. So really appreciate the support and if you've not subscribed yet, do hit the subscribe button. I've got lots of content coming for you uh, in the recent, in the near future, sorry. And uh, if you do find the content valuable, engaging uh, or useful, then please do go ahead and click that like button. It's really helpful for me to get this content in front of other eyes and ears. So pay it forward guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So today, I want to talk about the devalue stage. So, um, as many of you will know, uh, because you've uh, you've done been doing the research, you know you've been watching the videos, you've been digging into this um, disorder and learning more about what's happened or what's been happening to you, and um, and you will know a little bit about the devalue stage that is a part of the narcissistic cycle, the uh, the behavioural cycle. Um, that somebody exhibits with NPD. So don't want to teach you guys to suck eggs, okay? Uh, but just for the people who are kind of new or fresh to the content, um, briefly, the devalue stage is part of the behavioral cycle that is ingrained into this disorder. And um, generally speaking, uh, a narcissist will uh, kind of exhibit or express uh, this cycle which is part of a three-part cycle sometimes four so it starts with the love bombing stage we go to the devalue stage we eventually get to the discard stage now not all narcissists will hoover but that generally does come for those that do after the discard stage so as i've said in my other video um or videos the narcissist never really discards, so it's always going to be you that ends up doing the final discard. But what they like to do is shelve people in what I call the harem merry-go-round. Yeah, the harem merry-go-round. Um, that is essentially where they like to keep people until they want to use them again. Yeah, make it make sense, I know. So... Not all narcissists are uh, hoover, but a lot of them do. Now, I want to, as I said, dig into the devalue stage, but I also want to, um, I guess, unpack it a little bit and do that by using a scenario because I really want to break this down and just, I guess, exemplify how this devalue stage can happen at any moment. And more often than not, it's something that me or you would find pretty much insignificant but to the narcissist it's a slight it's an aggression it's an attack um and so i'd like to um begin the video to be honest with laying a little bit of context laying a little bit of foundational knowledge so that we all have a better um an equal should i say understanding um as we walk through this scenario so um so let's get into it i'm sure you've heard this before um it's been said by many people a narcissist um, doesn't see you as an individual um, they don't see you as somebody with agency or autonomy or independent thought um, they actually see you as an extension of themselves and you've probably heard this before so i want to start with just digging into that a little bit so the narcissist sees you as an extension of them and the reason behind that has a lot to do with the way a narcissist um, internalizes their own self-image so the way they perceive themselves and also the way they perceive the world as well so the external world and the people in it which to a narcissist um, aren't people they uh so people human beings like i say human beings with agency and autonomy and independent thought are seen as objects through a narcissist's eyes objects of utility that can be used when and how 
the narcissist feel, sees fit and, and feels to. So, uh, so yeah, they see us as them as one person and they see us, sorry, uh, us in the rest of the world as objects there for their utilization. Make that make sense, <laughs> right? But that's how they see it. So the narcissist's um, internal processes as it pertains to their own perception of themselves, their own self-image. Okay, it's very much like a swinging pendulum. So I just want you to imagine a swinging pendulum for a moment. Okay, bear with me. So on the right is all bad. And on the left is all good. Okay, so... The narcissist sees themselves very black and white, and you've probably heard that before as well because a lot of people have kind of made um, note of that in their content. So there's no gray areas with a narcissist. It's either all bad or all good. That goes for themselves and that goes for others as well in the world. So everybody else is all good or all bad, and so are they, no gray areas. So what does that have to do with the narcissist seeing you as an extension of them? Okay, let me go on. So on one side, you've got the narcissist trauma. That's the trauma they, that they experienced as a child. And they buried this trauma deep inside because it was too painful to deal with. It was painful for them to experience, painful for them to process, and pain, painful for them basically to face and to deal with. And that is the side of them that is buried deep down, um, revolving around shame and inadequacy and not being good enough and not being lovable and, you know, being um, stupid and, you know, um, not worthy and basically no good. So that's on one side. On the other side of this pendulum, you've got the false self. The false self is their narcissism. It's their defense. It's their defense to the trauma that is, uh, as I said, too painful for them to process and for them to manage and for them to deal with. So they created this defense, which is their false self. Their false self is their narcissism and the false self is all good. So the false self is a self image of you're great, you're perfect, you're unflawed, you are a genius, you are smart, you're intelligent, you are superior, you are better than, you know, others essentially. And that is all good. So like I say, it's very black and white with a narcissist. On one side, they've got their trauma. On the other side, they have their false self. And this is the way they experience themselves and the way they experience other people. All good, all bad, all black, all white. When supply, which is essentially the responses, the reactions, the emotions and the energy that they draw from other people. When that's potent, when that's high, when that's flowing in abundance, which usually happens when they meet somebody new, more often than not, which they would um, view as grade A supply, uh, when that is all fresh and exciting and the energy is flowing and it's new and it's intense and, and you know, it's a, it's a new project, it's a new challenge for them. Um, the new supply uh, is, is typically mirroring back a lot of positive, um, emotions and responses to the narcissist, the supply is really high. So when supply is high and when it's potent, the narcissist is basically just breaking even when it comes to the, uh, the self-image that they have, the emotions that they are experiencing, uh, the feelings that are being produced, the thoughts that are being produced in within themselves. They're basically breaking even. And they're, at this point, they're masquerading as a regular person and you would think they were a regular person and you wouldn't probably have too much of a clue that anything was wrong yes maybe there are some red flags maybe not but essentially they are they seem okay they seem all right it's when supply is low and typically that's when the narcissist will get bored because they always do they get bored really really quickly and this is typically when 
you move through the honeymoon stage. It becomes less intense. It becomes less exciting. You know, you kind of are getting used to each other now. It's not as um, it's not as mu much of a high as it was, let's say, uh, emotionally, right? So this is when the narcissist starts to get bored. They start to look for other supply. So when that supply is low, or um, absolutely it could be because um, somebody has disagreed with them, somebody is rejecting them, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a job, maybe uh, they went for a job and they didn't get the, uh, the opportunity that they wanted, but if they're slighted, if supply is low, if they're bored, if somebody disagrees with them in any way, because narcissists are highly sensitive to criticism, that can trigger their shame, that can trigger the pendulum to swing to the trauma side and ha they can have a trauma response or it could just be that they get bored. But when that supply goes low, when their shame gets triggered, this is when they have this internal conflict. So when they get this internal conflict going on, which is their trauma response to any criticism or any of the things that I've just mentioned, this is when they start to feel um, that shame, that inadequacy, that <clears throat> those feelings um, that are kind of resurfacing from their trauma, from their traumatic side, uh, which, as I said, is, is defended by their narcissism. These feelings of shame, inadequacy, self-hate, self-loathing, uh, they are feelings that they cannot process, they cannot manage them, they cannot work through them, they cannot self-soothe. That's where you come in. The narcissist essentially drags their supply, once identified, into the narcissism with them because they need you to regulate those emotions of trauma when they're triggered and that's why you essentially become an extension of the narcissist because the narcissist believes is stuck in is attached to their false self which is all good so anything that triggers shame which is all bad in the narcissist's eyes, needs to go somewhere. And they can't process that, they can't manage that, they can't self-soothe and, and, and walk through those feelings. So they need a target. The other thing that I wanted to um, kind of, I want everybody to understand is that a narcissist has no sense of self. They have no really rooted connection or they're not grounded in who they really are they haven't got that connection to themselves to their true selves because remember those feelings of shame that they buried years and years ago as a child they are not connected to them at all they have self-rejected that person that person in their eyes was never good enough and so they had to throw that away they had to reject that they had to rebuke that and they fully live within this false self which is purely shallow, obviously superficial, and it's not really made up of anything meaningful, deep, or with any kind of root in, in anything. It's not rooted to their soul. It's not rooted to their true emotions. It's basically just a shell, okay? And it's a collection of words that they have created and, and kind of made up and attached to this false self to create a character in which they live. They live in a fantasy and this is their false self. So it's, it's, so there's no sense of who they really are. They're not connected to their selves. So their whole sense of who they are comes from you, not just you, it'll come from all of the supplies that they collect over the years, all of the people that they interact with and build these superficial um, connections with, these addictionships or situationships, because they're not relational and they're not relatable. So they're not relationships, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would call them addictionships, to be fair. So... <clears throat> Narcissists are horrible, terrible communicators. But what they are really, really savvy with is reading people, reading people's verbal language and reading people's non-verbal language. So things like facial expressions, eye movements, you know, 
looking into your eyes and, and seeing how you're feeling. You know, the eyes are the windows to the soul and a narcissist is good at looking into people's souls. Oh yeah, they're great with facial expressions. They're great with um, any type of non-verbal language. So to all types of body language, uh, your tone of voice, your pitch, your breathing, your pace of breathing, anything and everything, any cue of communication, they can read it really, really well because they are highly sensitive to people's reactions because this is how they get their sense of self. And so this is why in my earlier videos, as I have explained, narcissists draw all of their energy, all of their validation and all of their sense of self from other people's reactions uh, responses, emotions, and feelings, okay? It doesn't matter if it's good or bad, as long as they get a response, a reaction, or an emotion from somebody, that's how they get their sense of self. You are essentially their mirror. That's what it is with a narcissist. So they can um, draw happiness from you, joy from you, excitement from you, frustration from you, anger from you, you know, disappointment from you, hurt from you. As long as they draw something from you, they know that they're relevant, they're important, they're significant, and that, they're ma that they matter to you. And that's how they get their sense of self. Oh, that person's happy with what I've just done. Great. Oh, that person's mad at what I've just done. Great. Either way, they feel significant. And I'm sure you already know this if you've watched any of this type of content is that a narcissist always has to be right. Always. Yeah, they always have to be right. They can never be wrong. They can never be flawed. They can never be at fault. So they always have to be in the right. And again, that is them in their false self and anything that puts them at fault or attempts to put them at fault or hide them to, uh, sorry, hold them to accountability, triggers shame, triggers inadequacy, triggers that trauma response that they have to escape from, that they have to project onto somebody else. And that somebody else usually is their romantic partner, their, you know, acquaintance, somebody that they're close to in, in their family or their friends. But it has to go somewhere because they have to repel that feeling project that feeling and be safe within their narcissism, which is their defense, which is their false self. I wanna share a scenario with you, which I thought was really interesting. And it exemplifies how quick and fast this devalue stage can, can kick in, okay? So let's give um, these two characters in this story a, a name. So John, let's say John is the, um, the gentleman with NPD and Jess is um, the person who he's just started to date. So John and Jess, they, uh, they've been dating, let's say they've been dating for about six weeks because that's usually um, a, reasonable, a reasonable time for the devalue stage to start kicking in, although it can be weeks, it can be a couple of months, you know, whatever the case may be. One particular week, John says, let's go and see a film. You know, I, I like movies. Uh, there's a particular film that I want to see. Um, let's make that our next day. And Jess was like, yeah, cool. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the cinema. Jess likes films too. So they go to the cinema. They, uh, they start watching um, this film. So they get to a part in the movie where there's a bit of a comedic um, bit. So... You know, some people are laughing, some people find it funny. John finds it really funny. He starts to laugh. Um, he enjoys the comedy. Uh, Jess doesn't really find it funny. She's maybe not her type of humour, so she doesn't really have that much of a response. She doesn't laugh. She she barely kind of pays any, any mind to it at all. The movie carries on. They enjoy the rest of the movie. Um, they part ways at the end of the night. They give a kiss and they go on their merry way. A couple of days later, John goes to see his mum and, you know, they're catching up. They are having, you know, small talk, chit chat, kind of just general catch up and um, saying what they've been up to, etc. John's mum says, so how's how's the dating going with uh, with Jess? You know, this new woman that you've got on your arm now. 
and um, and John says, yeah, it's going okay. Um, yeah, we've we've been seeing each other for for about six weeks now. You know, we've uh, been on a, f a good few dates. We went to the uh, cinema the other night, and it was a little bit weird. So his mum says, why? Why was it weird? What happened? And he said, well, there was this part of the film that was really funny, and um, and Jess didn't laugh. She uh, she just she just she didn't find it funny. I don't think she got the joke. I don't think she got it. And um, and his mum said, okay, well, you know, maybe she didn't find it funny. And so he goes on to say, well, I thought she was smarter than that. You know, it's just a bit disappointing. It was uh, it was a bit weird as well. It just felt a little bit weird. You know, I just um, I just don't understand why she didn't get the joke. So his mum said, you know, kind of brushed it off and said it weren't that important. They carried on with the conversation. It was about 30 minutes later and uh, and John says again, so do you think I should bring it up to Jess that she didn't get the joke? Um, because the whole, you know, the whole thing was a little bit, a little bit strange, you know, I thought that, I thought that she, she was smarter than that. So his mum said, um, I don't think it's a big deal, you know. I thought you liked her. Are you going to see her again? I mean, is this is this a deal breaker for you? He said, no, no, I'm going to see her again because, you know, we still haven't had sex. Uh, so I'm definitely going to see her again. Um, I don't know. I, I, I did like her, um, but I just think the whole thing was a little bit weird. So that's the scenario that I wanted to run past you. And if you haven't already figured out, the devalue has started, okay? And what I wanted to point out is that the devalue can start within a split second for a thing that we, like me and you, would find completely insignificant. But this is why the devalue happened. For all the reasons that I've just laid down, okay? Because Jess is an independent person with agency, independent thought and her own mind. She's an individual. But John doesn't see her as an individual. He sees her, or he did until this point, as an extension of his self. I.e., when I laugh, you laugh. Why are you not laughing? Why are you not responding the way that I'm responding? After all, you're an extension of me. And this is something that I can't quite work out. I can't understand what's going on. This is in the narcissist's mind, because at that point, He's realised, okay, up until that point, she's probably been mirroring him. There's probably not been, um, you know, an instance where he's thought, okay, this is an individual person with a different mind than me, who's got her own individual responses, emotions, her own individual humour and all the rest of it. So at that point, he realised that she's an individual and that is a slight to a narcissist. That is an aggression. That is them being not being in agreement with them. That is not that is them not mirroring them. And narcissists have to have that compliance. Also, like I said, they need to be mirrored. They get their sense of self from somebody else's mirroring. Okay. Jess's response was that of this isn't really humorous. This isn't really funny. You know, this isn't something that I would kind of buy into. Um, this is not really my sense of humour. And because Jess hasn't mirrored back to John that this is funny, this is a great laugh, this is great sense of humour, something as simple as that can really rattle a narcissist because you're not mirroring back that his reaction and what he finds interesting and what he's got taste in is validated, essentially. Because you're mirroring is a validation of their false self. So as simple as that. Have you ever burst out laughing in a room? You know, it could be with people, you know, it could be in a, in a public arena, you know, and no one else finds it funny. <laughs> because I have done that, you know, you, you might just have a, a sense of humor or might just get the giggles or something like that and nobody else really finds it funny. Yeah. To somebody who hasn't got MPD and who doesn't think that everybody else should mirror them and are an extension of them, 
it's not really a big deal. Yeah, you might feel a little bit like naked for a, for a second, like, <laughs> you know, you've really drawn attention to yourself. Um, but you just kind of let it go. It's like water off a duck's back, right? For a narcissist, that is a trigger of shame. That is a trigger of them being, hearing those voices, having them feelings. Um, no, you're, you're silly, you're embarrassing, you're stupid, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're this, you're that. And, um, and it's a trigger of shame because he hasn't had his self validated, his taste in humor, his response, his reaction, his enjoyment in the moment. He's not had that mirrored back. And because that's not been validated by that person's responses, that is a trigger of shame. And so he starts to feel those kind of traumatic responses. And as I said, narcissists always have to be right. Somebody's laughing, the other person isn't. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong because a narcissist doesn't have, doesn't think in the grey. There's no grey area with a narcissist, like I said. And so the devalue has to begin. And so you'll find that at this point, once you're split, once you're in that devalue box, there's no going back. Not that you'd ever want to go back, but there's no going back in the eyes of a narcissist. You're now all bad. You've aggressed them. You've slighted them. You are now essentially the enemy and you're on the way to being discarded. They will still come around you. They will still use you if they feel like they can get supply that they need from you. Resources. It could be affection. It could be attention. They you know, you could look great on their arm, you could um, give them positive association, it could be sex, it could be money, it could be anything, or it could, have be, it could be all of the above. But if they feel like you're useful to them, they will, keep, they will keep coming back. They'll keep coming back, but they will now start to abuse you. And don't get me wrong, the love bombing phase is some abuse, and that devalue and that discard is sure enough some abuse, but... It kind of looks different. The love bomb stage from the discard stage and the devalue stage looks different. But essentially, the devalue has begun. They will start to poke holes in um, in the person. So John, you know, the, the example, the scenario, he will start to pick holes at Jess. It'll be kind of a downhill spiral from there. So I just wanted to use that scenario to, I guess, just exemplify like i said how quickly uh, the discard can happen and for something so insignificant and this is how fragile a narcissist is their ego their false self the um, you know the way they view the world the way they view themselves <clears throat> is very superficial is wafer thin is very fragile and they are highly highly sensitive to any type of criticism and that criticism can come just by you being you just by you being a unique and independent individual with your own thought and your own mind so it's really interesting i think and you know i think the more understanding that i've kind of gained over the years has really helped me to um to heal and to realize that the things that happened to me and the things that could be happening to you or has happened to you, it's not about us. It's about them. It's about them and their disorder. It's about them and the way that they view themselves and the way they view the world. And there's nothing really much that you can do to stop that cycle of behavior. Well, there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop the cycle of behavior. Um, but again, it's not you, it's not got anything to do with you, but there's, you know, that there's not really much that you can do to help them to be, I guess, to be better people, to, to treat people better, you know. Um, somebody dropped a comment um, the other day and I said, yes, there is obviously um, options of therapy, but it's a very long road, it's a very hard road and the difficulty is that most narcissists won't even admit that they've got an issue, you know? Uh, so the chances are very slim, but again, that's not up to you to, um, to go through that journey. It's up to uh, the person that, um, that needs the treatment. 
So I'd just like to finish off by saying that I'd love this channel to be more community driven. So if you've got any videos that you'd like to talk to, like me to talk about, sorry, any topics that you feel like you'd like to know more about, um, that you'd like me to, um, to create for you, then drop me a comment and um, yeah, I'd be happy to um, touch on some of the topics that you choose. Until then, um, like I say, hit the like button if you found this useful and hit the subscribe button. And until next time, ciao for now.